presenting this afternoon, we're going to have Dr. Peter Jaffe, who you've met. Um, also, uh, Nicholas Bala, who's a professor at law at Queen's University and really is internationally recognized for his work as an expert on issues relating to children, youth, and families in the justice system, which includes um, work on separation and around family violence. You have already met Archana. Um, I also got to play a small role on this project, which was very lovely for me to be able to kind of be part of some of the discussions um, and understanding some of the issues. So uh, I'm here as well, and I'd like to also welcome, um, recognize Casey Oliver, who was a PhD student who helped a lot in terms of making the final product appear. So what final product am I talking about? <laughs> um, so there is no final product yet, but it's coming. This was uh, an update of, of a paper that was written a number of years ago. It was a contract through the Department of Justice. The opinions that we're going to present today and also in the paper are our own, and we do not speak for Justice Canada. Um, so in terms of the process, it started with, as I said, the update of an earlier paper by Jaffe, Bala, and Cricks. Um, and then um, the idea was we needed to update that paper, address re recent legislative reforms and case law. We started in early 2022. We had a draft paper submitted, a final paper submitted, and the expected publication date is fall 2023. So this is like a sneak preview, I guess. So it's very special. <laughs> uh, the primary audience for this work are really you, lawyers, judges, family justice systems, professionals, and to some extent, self-represented litigants. And the paper itself um, does a review of some of the literature on family violence updated, um, and then really gets into the issues about what's needed in terms of family violence and post-separation parenting, what kind of paradigm shift is needed, and what are some of the emerging best practices. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. I think we'll, we'll stay seated. I think we're going to be passing the clicker uh, back and forth. And we've learned from Lisa to practice before. Um, thanks, Lisa. <laughs> um, one of, that's a very exciting paper, and uh, uh, I can't wait till we can, we can share it. I have sent it out secretly to 1,000 people, and, and, hof <laughs> and, and hopefully they'll be circulating it. Uh, um, one of the major points in the paper is that for too long, the family justice system is seen as one size fits all. It's like a sausage factory. No matter what problem you have, you can end up with some sort of co-parenting plan. There's no time to get to court, no time to deal with things. And that plan works well for 80% of separating couples who are going to benefit from uh, mediation, parent education programs, collaborative lawyers who agreed not to fight. Um, but uh, there's some cases that need an off-ramp off this uh, superhighway of settlement. And there's obviously need, a, need an off-ramp for cases that are extreme conflict. People are not going to hurt each other or the children, but you can never be with them at the same school concert or baseball game. Uh, you have to come up with a parallel parenting plan that keeps them far apart from each other. But then there's cases that deal with family violence where you really need a whole different uh, analysis. Those are cases that require specialized assessments, looking at risk, uh, risk management plans. You need specialized counseling programs for children exposed uh, to intimate partner violence. Uh, you need to have a primary parent responsible for decision making, and you might have to consider supervised parenting time. So the paper really deals with this off-ramp, uh, recognizes that family violence is widespread and serious, and there's different remedies that are going to be required. Uh, all of you uh, know uh, too much about uh, power and control and, and coercive control. Uh, it's now in the law. We're all trying to catch up. Uh, the one thing that we have to recognize is that family violence is gendered. Each case before the court is unique. You know, just because you're a man or a woman uh, doesn't mean you're an abuser or a victim. Uh, we know that men are victims, women can be violent, there's violence in same-sex relationships. But across Canada, family violence is really a gendered issue and that has to be uh, addressed uh, in no, no uncertain terms. We know from, uh, statistically, uh, women are 
more likely to live in fear uh, of their partner, ex-partner, more likely to miss work because of the fear, more likely to have injuries, and are six times more likely to be killed by their partner. So the reality is that uh, family violence is very gendered and we have to address that, that context. Thank you, Peter. So um, as we've been discussing today, uh, abuse um, may involve physical violence or threats as well as financial sexual abuse. Uh, and a key issue is the emotional effects, course of control. And in fact, one can distinguish between cases where there is emotional control with that physical violence uh, and cases where there may have been some physical violence, but there's not that level of emotional control. And I think that's an important uh, factor to be kept in, in, in mind. Um, not, all, uh, not all cases of violence are coercive control. Uh, I think almost all cases of coercive control do involve some physical aspect, maybe just threats or intimidation, often though, uh, some a number of assaults over a period of time with those emotional effects continuing. Uh, and as Peter said, and we don't have you know, great data on everything, but uh, a significant portion of cases involve family violence. Most of them don't. So if you're a family lawyer and you have a typical practice, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be in every one of your cases. And I should say one of the things about family lawyers, we've done research, nobody has a typical practice. So you might say, hey, I have 100% of my cases have family violence. Uh, well, that, that speaks to probably, you know, you're working at the Schlieffer Clinic or whatever. Uh, one thing I would say, though, if you're a family lawyer, you can't have 0% of your case involving family violence. If you say it's zero, it's because you're not properly screening, which is something that we'll come and talk about. Um, and certainly, a family violence, a major focus here is on parenting cases, but it very much affects financial issues as well, and maybe in some cases even more so. Um, so it's important to, to see that context. Um, and as Peter said, and as I'm sure you all know, there's certainly very much a gendered dimension to these issues, both in terms of parenting, finance, and so on. And indeed, what, what many victims do is they say, you know what, uh, if I don't ask you for any money, you won't come and want to see the kids, and that's the way I'm going to try to deal with this situation. Obviously, not an appropriate, not, and not sanctioned by law, but that is a, a reality. One of our key themes in the paper, and, and I think here today, is that um, family violence, inter violence, is a differentiated phenomenon. So trying to get an assessment, uh, both if you're an individual lawyer, from the point of view of the judiciary, what is really going on here? And in the paper, we do talk about that there are relationships where there's a single incident of violence. Some of them, I think, talk about separation and gendered violence. There are relationships where there's not been any violence, there's uh, an allegation or really discovery of infidelity, and somebody hits the other person, and then they walk out, and so on. And that's a crime, of course, and, but it's not a characteristic of the relationship. Uh, it may be shocking, but it's not having that emotionally controlling effect. But there are other relationships, and probably more common, where the violence is ongoing, repetitive, uh, and, and that's where you have the greatest concern. And a key point that's been mentioned many times here, separation is a time of heightened risk of physical violence, homicide, and so on. Um, one of the issues is, of course, from the perspective of lawyers and judges, is uh, how do you prove that this has occurred? And also, are there false and unfounded allegations of family violence? And but that uh, was asked in a session today, and of course, um, the issue, yes, it turns out women do lie, and, and women are mistaken, and different people are mistaken. But seeing that in a context, which is that most, and, and by the way, when you say, are people, are, are women who report domestic violence ever either mistaken, exaggerating, dishonest, some sort of spectrum in there, the answer is context really matters. So if you are sitting in a hospital emergency ward as a physician, and you see women coming in, and, and they're injured, and they're sort of, oh, they just fell down, and then they, you ask some more as a doctor, and you discover that actually, they say, well, actually, he hit me. You probably have a 0% false allegation rate. I mean, there's no, there's no incentive, and indeed, there's a, uh, if you're in a family court, it turns out, by the time you get to the litigation process, there's a certain rate of unfound allegations. Uh, some research suggests in, in family court, it could be as high as 25% uh, of the case that get to trial are unfounded slash exaggerated 
and, and there's obviously problems with that or questions about that research. Um, I'll come back, by the way, and talk about, you know, that sounds high, uh, alienation, which is another concept we'll talk about. Uh, the rate of unfounded allegations of alienation is about 75%. In other words, you get a lot more false allegations of alienation, unfounded. Uh, we've mentioned Berengret and Greb, you know, we mentioned this, the role of the Supreme Court of Canada, and certainly Berengret and Greb Leunius is an extremely important case. Uh, I would say the most important family violence case maybe in, in Canadian history. Of course, we had other cases, Lavalle and so on. But certainly from the point of view of parenting, recent, uh, very significant case that uh, uh, discusses family violence from many perspectives. And I assume you've all read it, but it turns out one of the things I do, I'm, I'm a law professor, I, of course, I don't go to court, I don't have clients. All I do is sit around and read case. And it, I would say, with all respect, there seem to be some judges in Ontario who are writing decisions who don't seem aware of this case. Um, because they actually cite other cases that were reversed by this case, uh, and they seem to have missed this one. So if you're a lawyer in a family violence case, or for that matter, a shared parenting case, and maximum parenting time, some of you have heard the concept of maximum parenting time, which, was, and I loved, we were so lucky to have Justice McLaughlin here, but uh, she and Gordon Gertz are talking about maximum contact, maximum parenting time. In Baron Grant and Greb Leunius, they specifically say that is not the law anymore. We don't have a maximum parenting time concept. Parliament says it's not there. The Supreme Court of Canada has not said it's not there. There are some judges in Ontario who seem to still be citing that. So you, you want to talk about this case. And certainly, this case directly addresses every issue that we're talking about in this conference. Uh, about the, the significance of family violence. She cites some of our prior work about the fact that uh, family violence uh, is a, has grave implications for the development of children. Really nice to hear the Chief uh, Justice talking about that. Um, and, but Justice Karakasana says recognize it in a, in a more in-depth way uh, and talking about about that and the fact that uh, it doesn't, that family violence does not necessarily end or the emotional effects on the children don't end at the point of separation. So it might be that one can say, oh, since we separated, there's been no physical violence, but the emotional effects will well continue into the litigation process, this idea of litigation abuse. And in fact, on the facts of this case, one of the key things was, yes, the, the last physical assault was when they separated, when the woman left her husband, but he continued to abuse her, uh, emotionally harassing emails, uh, affidavits, and so on, right through the trial process. Um, and, and certainly recognizing this issue of proof, um, and so saying, uh, recognizing that it's notoriously difficult to prove, and then there are real questions. Do judges ever get the facts wrong? I mean, judges are in the business of credibility assessment can be extremely difficult. But she says, she points out that if there's even one instant of physical violence is proven and the emotional effects may well be ongoing and need to be taken into uh, account. Actually, I was impressed that Supreme Court case referred to our earlier version of the paper we're talking about now. So I'm hoping the future Supreme Court will refer to the, uh, the, the new paper. Um, <laughs> We, we have a number of handouts uh, as part of the, uh, our publication dealing with coercive control, because that's one of the hardest things to explain. It's not hard to explain if you're working in a shelter for abused women in 1973, but it's hard if you're a lawyer in 2023. Uh, people, we've always been talking about it, but now it's there in law and people have to start uh, thinking about it uh, in terms of what it means and coercive uh, control as defined. Uh, is really, it's, it's amazing to me the way it's been defined because it's defined in, in all its possible forms, in, including uh, engendering fear in uh, family members who may fear for their safety from being exposed to the violence. So uh, I think that's a very uh, important and exciting part of the, the legislative change. Uh, part of our handouts that we've produced uh, uh, for lawyers and, and also mental health professionals who may be involved in, in doing assessments for the court or providing assistance or mediators is being aware what, what's the impact that you might see uh, in victims of course of control. Uh, not only uh, fear, not only feeling worn down emotionally and financially, and Nick will come back to financial abuse as an important aspect of 
Coercive control doesn't end with separation. It continues and takes other forms, uh, in, including litigation abuse. Uh, survivors who may not be able to trust their own decisions. Uh, I had an interview recently uh, with a survivor and uh, uh, asking about different forms of parenting time. And, uh, and I was just probing, asking uh, questions. And uh, I could see uh, every question I led uh, led the survivor to come up with a new plan, saying maybe she wasn't being generous enough. You know, She couldn't trust her own decision making, thought she was being too hard uh, on her ex, rather than remaining focused on, uh, on children's safety. So it's, uh, I think many survivors uh, can feel like over time, uh, they are feeling crazy. Um, gaslighting is a, is a common technique now. I know that sometimes the term is overused, but it's important to look at all the different forms of coercive control. I, I would suggest that every family lawyer uh, doing this work needs to have some checklist, needs to have uh, something like this laminated at their desk to make sure they're really asking the questions. I think all too often, um, uh, I, I think um, lawyers expect the clients to be the experts. I mean, the clients Litigants have the lived experience, but they don't understand how to frame things that may be essential uh, in law in terms of how things are, are presented. So it's important to uh, to recognize all the different forms of coercive control. And ultimately, the most important thing is coercive control has to inform parenting decisions, parenting time. You cannot make findings of coercive control and expect people to be couples to be co-parents and make and have joint decision making. It creates a never-ending war with a, a power imbalance. So uh, findings about coercive control has to lead to approaching cases very differently in terms of uh, parenting time and parenting decision-making. Thank you, Nick and Peter. So now I'll focus on how family violence is intersectional. Every individual experiences many forms of uh, inequity or operations. We know that everyone is different and shaped by their lived experiences. Harvard legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw coined this term of intersectionality in 1989. It's been quite a number of years. In her own words, intersectionality is a lens that we can use as a practitioner. It's a prism. It is multidimensional, and it would allow us to examine how various forms of discrimination, of inequality, often operate together. So if we are aware about intersectional lens, we can better acknowledge and ground the differences amongst us. Kimberly Crenshaw showed us how black women face racial and gender prejudice. On the other hand, black man faces only racial prejudice. So the intersection is important. If we look at how intersectionality approaches the different dimensions for analysis, there are four major dimensions that I would like to share. One is the oppressive experiences are synergistic. They're happening at the same time. Secondly, they are non-additive or integrative. So they're happening at the same time, but they are having a cumulative impact. The third one is simultaneous. They are happening, all the systems are working on that individual at the same time. And lastly, it is multiple. So these are the four dimensions. If we keep it in mind, it allows us to analyze anything that we are looking at in terms of facts from our client in intersectional light. With that, we can plot the subject location of individuals on the family's power ladder. In the context of family justice system, various factors can result in power imbalances between the parents. And the examples could very well be substantive knowledge or lack of it, financial or economic position, social status, cultural background, dominant personality, control over children, because we're talking about parenting, and the history of being a decision maker in the family. So we tend to talk about racial inequality as separate from inequality based on 
gender, class, sexuality, or immigrant status. But intersectional lens allows us to see how people are subject to all of these at the same time. And their experiences are not the just sum of its parts. It can inform our understanding of Section 15 of Charter. We were just discussing about that in the other context, which prohibits discrimination based on race, national, or ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, or mental or physical disability. So intersectional framing is a concept of substantive equality. It's right of equal protection of law and equal benefit of law. So what we are trained as lawyers, this is what intersectionality allows us to do better as a framework. So it can be used as analytical tool to analyze complexities of inequality, which is rarely caused by a singular factor. So we all think that we are playing on a level playing field, but we are not. We need to seek to understand the intersection of privilege and operation within the person's wider context of family, society, culture, and religion. Diversity is reality, but inclusion is a choice. We all want to check our unconscious biases, prejudice, and discrimination is not just a word. It affects real people that we serve. World has become complex, multidimensional, and as family lawyers, we all deal with relationships. Researchers have debated that all relationships involve some sort of persuasion or influence. So the question is, when does the control become coercive? The answer is the feature of that relationship when it brings the fear factor that's where it becomes coercive. Intersectionality is the framework which will be helpful for us to identify the context in which the family violence happens. So this is the research project in BC, uh, how BC's family law system puts survivors in danger. When the family violence is raised, how does the legal system respond was the key central idea of this research. And the theme emerged, which is the key theme on this slide you are seeing. It says that women in our research raised how compounding issues, which is what intersectionality allows us to understand, impacts them through poverty, systemic racism, lack of affordable housing, disability, living in rural areas, being a member of LGBTQI2S+, or even having an immigrant status. In diverse communities, the impact of family uh, violence is complicated by cultural aspects that are involved in it. For example, in certain collectivistic cultures, the family group takes priority over the individual's happiness. There is a high value in both family and public perception about keeping family matters private. So intersectional considerations are required to decide the most appropriate parenting plan in the context of family violence. That's what we are talking about. We need to consider an individual's life circumstances across diverse cultural context, which includes intergenerational trauma. Consideration of factors such as economic class, resources, or immigration status, race, ethnicity, indigeneity, religion, and disability is crit critical as well. So just to dive into an example uh, of South Asian multi-generational families. Canada's South Asian population in itself is diverse, but there are many multi-generational families with expectations for traditional gender roles. A wife may be abused and controlled not only by the husband, but also by his parents. And in that context, UK has introduced laws related to recognizing coercive control through the extended family members. There may be pressure on abused women not to disclose abuse or even to return to abusive relationship. And it's not surprising if her own parents and members of the community would push for that reconciliation. 
Again, looking at the impact of culture and the role of extended family, we have to look around us and see that there is a huge ethnic shift in Canada. There is substantial increase in number of people who identify as visible minorities. Almost 7.6 million people in Canada identify as people of color today. In the families of collective cultures, it's crucial to understand the role of extended family members, but even the courts have to recognize that they're dealing with these complex family uh, patterns and different parenting traditions. In the context of family violence within the family unit, which is diverse, it's important for us as family practitioners to be able to identify forced marriages, sex selective abortion of female fetus, son preference, and dowry. These are some of the examples. There could be many more. So we need to be able to properly screen such cases and properly assess the risk involved. I'll come back to that later. That obviously one of the themes uh, that we keep coming back to is making sure that parenting plans uh, obviously take, uh, include an intersectional analysis and recognize that there's not gonna be one size that fits all, especially with family violence cases. So obviously the key factors that that we keep coming back to in our paper, and, and Nick will be summarizing it at the end, is looking at the nature of the violence, you know, the timing of disclosure, whether it's the point of crisis, uh, or whether there's uh, has been time for the court to gather uh, proper assessment information and background. Also looking at the availability of resources uh, in terms of supervised uh, parenting time or counseling for victims or perpetrators or children. So these are things that uh, are important considerations. The, the one consideration uh, that I think is, is so important in the amendments to the Divorce Act is finally recognizing harm to children living with domestic violence. It wasn't too long ago that I was testifying in a family court and talking about the harm of exposure uh, to the children in the family. And the judge, in this case, uh, looked at me somewhat puzzled and he said, Doctor, I don't understand. He never laid a hand on his kids. And I said, Your Honor, with all due respect, you don't have to lay a hand on kids to harm them. Growing up with uh, domestic violence is itself a form of psychological and emotional abuse. Growing up in a war zone, growing up uh, with a parent who's a terrorist, uh, domestic terrorist, has significant consequences. And we now know from the research that exposure to domestic violence from infancy through to uh, teenage years can have significant impact in terms of creating trauma as well as significant emotional behavior problems. Exposure to domestic violence is now one of the most frequent forms of identified maltreatment and referrals to, to child protection agencies. Uh, protecting children with domestic violence is actually also a matter of life and death. Uh, across Canada in our national study looking at 200, looking at 815 domestic homicides over a 10 year period, uh, about 11 to 12 percent of the homicides were children killed in the context of domestic violence. If you look at death review reports from Canada, the U.S., New Zealand, Australia, and the U.K., children are seen to be at very serious harm, uh, certainly from a parent killing children as an act of revenge for the victim leaving the relationship. So we have to be conscious of the risk and be aware that the danger of, dangers of separation, not only for the adult victims, but also for the children. And the children who survive the homicide uh, are left exposed to the most horrific trauma possible, and they are gonna be losing one or both parents with the most horrific consequences with lives that are disrupted forever. So coming back to the aspect of screening and I'll just take the approach of screening for the family lawyers, but we can, we, we can look at it from the triage at the court administration level as part of screening as well. But looking at why it's important for us as family lawyers to screen, many things that I'm gonna say would be very obvious, but when we look at it as the reasons 
I hope that, and we are all hoping that there would be more and more people screening as family lawyers. So all cases of divorce and separation need to have initial screening for family violence. Courts and professionals have to identify the risks, as uh, we just heard, for ongoing abuse and to assess power imbalances. It also includes the safety of victims and children uh, in any negotiation process, and we know that the risks are real. It is important that the professionals like us, as family lawyers at least, do not pressure the victims into dispute resolution processes and settlements that may place the children or even themselves at the risk of harm. Early screening for assessment of risk, early identification of family violence, and resulting into early intervention and possible prevention is where we want to go. Early intervention will connect the families with services that are designed to have proper outcome for their children. We as family practitioners have to be able to identify the patterns of coercive control, resulting emotional and physical and psychological effects on survivors and the children. So screening allows us to take three-prong approach, prevention, early intervention, and if the cases have gone too far, de-escalation. Screening will allow us to go to the roots of the problem. If we ask right questions, it leads to the conflict onion being peeled to the point where you start seeing clearly. The effects of violence on children are concerning. Children's safety and well-being is crucial, and the amendments to Divorce Act aim to reduce the adverse childhood experiences, or ACAs. So when we are considering the best interest of the children, Divorce Act Section 16.4 requires the court to consider the factors relating to family violence. So the key question is how do we screen effectively? We cannot look into children's issues in isolation and we have to connect the dots between the conduct of a parent with their children with their parenting time. And proper screening will allow lawyers to argue what parenting time is consistent with the best interest of the children. Very briefly, I'll speak about the help toolkit. Most likely, it is that you have already heard about it or using it, but this tool provides family lawyers with practical suggestions on how to identify and respond to family violence in a way that is safe for their clients. The acronym HELP represents four components of recommended approach. One is how to have initial discussion about family violence with your client, explore immediate risks and safety concerns, learning about family violence to help decide what you recommend to your own client, and to promote safety throughout the family law case. If we use the help toolkit with intersectional lens, and that's the important combination that we have to keep in mind, we can understand the invisible power relations and how they shape inequality. As we look at the interlocking uh, aspects between the parents and children, that's what intersectionality is about. Very briefly, understanding the coercive control as a pattern of behavior, which is successful when there is a need for less violence because there is entrapment and fear already. So the in, uh, insidious nature of coercive control makes it incumbent on us fa as family lawyers to ask appropriate questions to our clients. If we don't gather appropriate facts and information, we cannot competently represent them in the court. Lastly, dealing with the diverse families we need to have cultural competency. We have to understand the other-oriented, open-minded method of questioning. And the help toolkit has a specific aspect uh, and series of questions that would allow you to start asking those questions in the method that they have recommended, and you can adapt it further to your needs. It's important that we recognize the agency that our clients 
who are explaining their own positions would be able to choose how do they want to take their lives further in the court, in court litigation, or outside of that. Thank you. Uh, so, um, as has been mentioned, our, one of our, th our central theme probably is the need for a differentiated response to family violence. And one dimension of that is uh, for lawyers who are representing perpetrators, alleged perpetrators, possible perpetrators, and there was a very good uh, session on that this morning, um, recognize they have to be involved in some ways. I mean, in most cases, it's not going to be there's a victim, there's a perpetrator, the perpetrator will just go away forever. Sometimes that happens, but more often, he, and it usually is a he, will be involved and should be involved. On some level, the children want or may need that or benefit from it. And so thinking about that, if, particularly for both the lawyers who are representing those people, very good discussion about how to engage them, how to get them to change over time. But one of the things about family law in particular that's very both interesting and challenging is it's not a one-time thing. It's seeing the clients change over time. Not all clients can and will change, but in both family, domestic, and child protection, helping the clients to understand and get and recognize they have to change and getting them in touch with the resources that will allow them to do them do that is incredibly valuable and a key part of that process. Obviously also working with the victims and then one uh, dimension of this uh, is uh, recognizing that there is, if you want, some overlap between what one can define as high conflict cases, domestic violence cases, alienation cases. I think those are all valid concepts and they also overlap. How does one deal with that in a particular context, how does one see it, whether it's a lawyer or a judge. Um, and certainly, I mentioned the issue of alienation. Some people say, oh, it's not a concept at all. I think there are two things are about it. There are children who are influenced by a parent to reject the other parent. But I think more commonly what happens is, the, uh, well, and there are children who are, and we've heard this, genuinely frightened of uh, the, uh, their parent who has been abusive. But there are also a lot of situations where there's high conflict between the parents, where there's a lot of anger, hostility, which may be related to family violence or whatever. And as the children get older, they get exhausted and say, I just can't live with this conflict. And the only way to deal with that is to side with one parent. And I'm not gonna see the other parent. It's not really alienation at all. It's a response to the conflict. Um, and I mentioned, are there, follow, are, are, are there genuine allegations of al alienation? Yes. But it turns out that if you look at the cases uh, where it's raised, only about 25% of them does the judge conclude that there's actually alienation. And of course, one go, well, what do judges know? But uh, it, it suggests that there's a, a high level of raising alienation when it's not really alienation. Conversely, most cases, and we've heard this in many ways, where family violence is raised are genuine cases of family violence. Um, certainly one of the key issues uh, in, in this area for those who are working with um, survivors uh, and who are judges or thinking about educating judges is recognizing the effects of trauma on the capacity of and, and uh, situation of victims of violence and of course as many of you know they're, they're very difficult or they may be challenging clients. Uh, because of what has happened to them. They may be indecisive, they may go back to the abuser and so on. Uh, one needs to recognize the context which they're coming from and certainly again in the court, sometimes the person who's been the perpetrator of violence, the man, is presents especially well in court, he's charming and so on, and the victim seems quote unquote lacking credibility because she, her memory or uh, her presentation may be affected by that. So being aware of the effects of trauma uh, is extremely important. Um, there is this notion, and I think it's an important one on a certain level, that in our present legislation, the attitude of a parent towards the other parent or being supportive of the relationship is a fact to be taken into account. And I think that most genuine victims of family violence actually want their children to have a relationship. They're not saying, I never want the kids to see him. They're saying, I want them to see him, have a relationship, but I want to be safe. How are we gonna structure that? How are we gonna do that? In some cases, it may happen right away. In other cases, it's gonna happen over time. So thinking about that 
uh, and seeing again the family process as a dynamic process is very important. Another issue that uh, is raised, and there's a um, one of the uh, brochures out there deals with the issue of litigation abuse. This is sort of a, an emerging concept. Uh, on one level, it's an emerging concept. On the other hand, it's been around since the beginning of family justice. Uh, that sometimes people are misusing the family process. In other words, one thinks of a judge, at least conceptually, as being someone who will resolve a dispute, uh, listen to the evidence, resolve a dispute, uh, and people were there in, in good faith trying to put forward their case. Often, uh, especially when there's been family violence, the litigation process itself is being abused uh, unnecessary delay, I think somebody was mentioning, uh, people who actually could afford a lawyer choosing to self-represent, uh, making unfounded complaints to children's aid societies, police, and so on. There are many aspects to this violation of court orders, again, uh, an another classic example. Um, and while on one level, <clears throat> uh, there are certainly women, again, who abuse the family justice process, and, and this is probably an area where it's not uh, you know, eight to two, but women were probably here sort of two to one uh, in the sense that uh, men are more likely to abuse the litigation process, but there's certainly a significant number of women who defy court orders, don't properly disclose, and so on. But in family violence cases, the, the litigation process itself can exacerbate the condition of the, perpetra of the victim uh, and make it more difficult. And so being aware of, of the stress of litigation, and you're all on some level aware of the stress of litigation for your clients, but it becomes particularly problematic or challenging or destructive in family violence cases. Um, so our, and I, I realize we're, we're out of time, uh, and we've actually used our time very effectively because we're almost out of slides. Um, the, you know, the, the key thing here is that there need to be differentiated responses, and so our, th this concluding diagram, and, and of course there's a huge there's a lot there, but what's saying, if you're involved in a family violence case, whether as a lawyer or as a judge um, or otherwise, thinking about where are you, what, kind, what was the nature of that, is that family violence? Is there coercive control? Conversely, if you want, at the lowest end, was there just one instance of family violence? Uh, how are, are the children direct uh, victims of abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, which they often but not always are? Where are you in that process? Um, and so looking at that. Secondly, what are the resources available both in the community and for this family? And one of the realities, of course, is that if people have more resources, they are going to be better able to, for example, if there's an allegation of family violence and dad says, well, I'll just bring in a supervisor and, and can pay for that and so on, that's great. But if you say, well, actually, uh, uh, I, I have to have a supervised access and there's no resources available, I can't afford it, you're gonna have, we have the reality is we have a differentiated, uh, we have two-tier justice. And in her own way, I thought again that the Chief Justice was, was wonderful in many ways, but she did kind of acknowledge, oh yeah, well, we need change, that means because right now we don't have the right kind of resources. And certainly thinking about where you are in that process, so the time of greatest danger is the time of separation. Uh, and one of the, you know, the, 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 the biggest challenge, I think, for lawyers and judges is the interim hearing or the, those interim stages. Because if you're two, or, you know, when you get to trial, if it's two or three years later, you can say, oh, well, maybe there was a problem two years ago, but things have been fine since then. Or conversely, it's been escalating. This guy has been continuing harassment. So you know where you are when you're at trial, when you're at that interim stage, incredibly challenging for both the lawyers and the uh, and, and, the, and certainly the judges. Um, so we're, I don't think we have time for questions and comments, or maybe we do, but we do have one, we do have one announcement because people have been asking, when can we get the slides, or how can we get the slides? Well, first, actually, you have to answer a question. Um, from, uh, I'll take one question here from BC and then one from the room. So the question from um, our BC colleagues who have joined us is really about the, the statement early, early on about 15 to 20 percent of family law cases involving violence, then therefore sort of 80 to 85 percent not. Can you talk a little bit about how you get to that estimate? That's the question. How did you get that number? So, of course, there's a question about how one, and I, I take a Peter wants me to answer this one. I, I want to give a second <laughs> opinion, but you go first. 
I mean, if, if you liked, uh, uh, and by the way, we know that uh, if you count how many, uh, and of course there's research on this, and in our paper, uh, which will you eventually get, there are sites to different studies. Um, and I think going back, it depends on your population. There are some of you who will say, my, my clientele is 75, 80% family violence. There, uh, that's not a typical case, though, but that's certainly typical of some populations, some communities. Uh, all of these, you know, one can say both the, the stats, by the way, are vary by location. They also probably vary over time. One of the happy realities is we have a lower spousal homicide rate now than we did 40 years ago. We actually had a higher rate before. So you say, where are these, so there's, there's research. If somebody says, oh, I think it's 28% uh, and somebody else, oh, I think it's 23%. Uh, the, the, a key point is it's certainly well under half, if you like to say, you know, and it's, it's a way more than zero. So it's somewhere in there. It's a lot of cases, but it's not, it's certainly not the majority of cases. Uh, but we, we, there are, you know, if you say, uh, can I cite the study off the top of my head? Nope, but if you send me an email, I'll send you some, uh, there's my email, I'd just be happy to send you some research on that. Peter, you said you wanted a second opinion? Yeah, not, not enough time. I, I, I will be brief, though. A lot depends on, on how you do the research. I mean, if you're doing a broad community sample in general about the existence of intimate partner violence, it's, it's extremely high. If you look at the extent to which people report or disclose intimate partner violence when they're in family court, it's a lot lower. Many victims don't want to disclose, they don't want to be engaged in the, in the process. Uh, they're just looking for settlement, looking to end the relationship and get out with an escalation. So I think it's hard, hard research to do. The, the bottom line is the cases that never seem to go away, the ones that are more likely to be in the middle of the court system usually involve intimate partner violence, child abuse, addictions, mental health. We know those numbers are quite high in those cases that are that are before the court. And uh, yes, go ahead. It's on the same subject, actually. I've been citing a stat that you used in your 2015 paper that it's about a quarter of cases, and now you're saying it's 15 to 20. So I'm just wondering how you're arriving at that number. Like, what, what's the calculus that gives you an estimate of prevalence? I mean, you're talking about a, a whole variety of research, but you've settled on two different numbers. Um, eight years apart, so I'm just wondering how I can understand those numbers. So, uh, and all these numbers that we're all talking about are uh, time, uh, methodology development, as Peter has pointed out, how, and definition, so how do you define it? Um, there, and, and are you looking, for example, at reported court cases, and so there are cases where people don't disclose it, uh, or are you looking at listening to victims? Um, and so I, you know, I, I'd be the first to say, oh, 10 to 25 percent, that sounds like a pretty big band. No, I think that sounds like a sort of a reality there. You say, oh, I mentioned, no, 25 percent are unfounded. Where does that come from? And of course, there, there is a study there, but you say, well, I don't, you know, that study is either not consistent with my experience or with, um, uh, you know, reality. And in all these cases, we don't really know what the reality is in the sense of reality is out there. It's very broad, it's changing over time, it's a diverse population. Um, and um, so that's, you know, I, I would say if you like 10 to 25 percent better on that slide, uh, I'd be, you know, I wouldn't disagree with that. But a, a key point is certainly more than zero, a lot more than zero, and way less than 50 percent. Yeah, I, I wouldn't get, I, my personal view is uh, intimate partner violence is grossly underreported period. So I, I wouldn't get hung up on, on that number by itself. I'll, I'll tell you, you want to hear a shocking number that's never been published? Uh, years ago, the Canadian Panel on Violence Against Women and Children did a study in the, in the Toronto area, uh, surveyed hundreds of women about whether they'd ever been a victim of any kind of abuse in an intimate relationship or any kind of uh, sexual violence in any form with the broadest definition included, including uh, inappropriate touching, exposure. And the statistic was 98% of women report some sort of violence in their lives at some point between childhood and adulthood. It was 98%. And the number was so high it was never published because the, the uh, people involved, many people involved, they just thought it was so high that nobody could understand it or appreciate it. But it, but, but it's, yeah. Hey, uh, I, 
I was, I was the only man on a nine-person panel. There was eight women. I had, uh, I did, it was a close vote. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's reality, and, and that doesn't surprise anybody if you, if, if it doesn't surprise women, period. Anyway, so the, the numbers that are really out there are shocking, and they're grossly underreported. And one of the reasons why they're underreported, nobody asks. You know, or they ask, then people don't want to tell. So, I mean, I think we have to do a better job asking and, uh, and, and making sure people feel they're in a safe space to make those disclosures. So I would like to thank all of the presenters for this session. Just hold on for a second. Thank everybody. Say goodbye to our colleagues uh, in BC and to others who are joining us later on this uh, presentation. So thank you.